We are very, very privileged to have with us today Mr. Gary Bourne, who is partner and chair of the International Arbitration Group at Wilmer Hale. Uh, Gary is one of the most distinguished practitioners in the world in the field of international arbitration. He also has a very distinguished academic profile, having, author, uh, having authored, among other things, the magnum opus that we mentioned before on international commercial arbitration, which is really magnum for 4,000 pages. Um, and it is truly, truly a pleasure, Gary, for you having accepted our, our invitation and for addressing um, us today on the topic of bits, bats, and butts, reflections on international dispute resolution. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Marco, and, and thank all of you for coming. I can't imagine that any of you would, in fact, want to have um, a second helping, but as Marco says, in the event that you do, it'll, it'll be on the website. Um, I think with a title like Bits, Bats, and Butts, um, I should start with an explanation, an explanation of the title. Um, the title involves first bits, bilateral investment treaties, which you no doubt are familiar with from your public international law and investment law courses. And I'll say some words about bits in the first third of, of this talk. BATS, bilateral arbitration treaties, um, are creatures which don't yet exist, but the thesis of this talk is that they should exist. And I'll spend a fair amount of time describing both what BATS, bilateral arbitration treaties, are and setting out some of the arguments for why these creatures, these bats, ought in fact to exist, although they currently don't. And finally, buts are all the reasons that will no doubt be going through your mind as I reach the second end of the second part of my talk as to why in fact there should be no bats, the buts to my argument in favor of bilateral arbitration treaties. And I'll try objectively to address those buts, but hopefully in the process of doing that, be able to demonstrate that those buts in fact are not serious reasons for um, doubting the wisdom of bilateral arbitration treaties. I should also say preliminarily that as the rest of the title reflections on international dispute resolution suggests the, the lecture is also meant to be a, a platform, um, a, a means for exploring the current state of international dispute resolution, thinking about what it does, whether it does that well or, or not so well. And even if at the end of the day the butts prevail over the bats, nonetheless the process of thinking about what our system currently is may help identify weaknesses and at least point the direction um, towards improvements in, in that system. But enough by way of the title, why don't I turn to the first of the three installments, BITS, Bilateral Investment Treaties. We all know that in the 1950s and thereafter, pretty much over the last 60, 70 years, states around the world, and at this point it is almost all states, concluded a network of bilateral treaties, bilateral investment treaties that in broad perspective did two things. The first thing that these treaties did was grant substantive protections to foreign investors in a host state. So let us say hypothetically, Singapore and Romania would conclude a bilateral investment treaty. In that treaty, Singapore would guarantee Romanian investors certain substantive international protections against things like expropriation, denial of fair and equitable treatment, other basic human rights. And the second thing that these bits, these bilateral investment <coughs> treaties did, was create a procedure a procedural mechanism for enforcing these substantive rights. 
Much thought was given to what sort of procedural mechanism might be used to give effect to those substantive protections because they were rightly thought to be quite important. Thought was given to creating an international investment court or some other international tribunal or providing that disputes under bilateral investment treaties could be resolved by some existing international tribunal, the ICJ, for example. All those solutions, though, were rejected for a variety of reasons. And instead, what BITS did was to provide, for the most part, for international arbitration as the means of dispute resolution for disputes arising between foreign investors on the one hand and host states on the other. The creative aspect of BITS was also to provide automatically for the arbitration of investment disputes under the BITS. That meant that in contrast to ordinary international commercial arbitration, if I can call it that, in fact, no international commercial arbitration is ordinary. But in contrast to the usual process of negotiating bilateral commercial arbitration agreements included in a case-by-case -case basis on individual contracts, what BITS did was create a standing offer on the part of the host state to arbitrate any investment dispute with a covered investor arising under the bilateral investment treaty. So when a dispute arose, that dispute could automatically be referred to international arbitration. And the reason that this mechanism was adopted, and there has been, will no doubt continue to be controversy about aspects of this dispute resolution mechanism, the reason that it was adopted was because it was thought to be more efficient, more objective and fair, more final, more speedy, more expert than the alternative means of dispute resolution. Many of the same reasons that provided the rationale for international commercial arbitration. And over time, over the last 60 or 70 years, some 3,000 bilateral investment treaties were adopted between virtually all capital exporting and virtually all capital importing states. There are, to be sure, some states that have declined to follow that path, the BIT path, and there have been some states, a few states, only a small number, but a few, that have denounced some or all of the bilateral investment treaties that they have adopted. But the overwhelming picture when one steps back from it and looks at it over time is one where a vast network of bilateral investment treaties providing for this form of arbitration of investment disputes has been adopted by states from all parts of the world with all political and legal heritages. Um, that mechanism, the bilateral investment treaty arbitration mechanism, in a sense learned from international commercial arbitration. It adopted the basic dispute resolution mechanism of in international commercial arbitration, namely arbitration in which parties selected the arbitral tribunal for a particular dispute and then proceeded under a very skeletal set of procedural rules which for the most part were articulated on a case-by-case -case basis as well designed to reflect what the parties in a particular dispute wanted and what the particular dispute called for. <coughs> Procedures hand-tailored to the specifics of the dispute that was before the tribunal at the time. And then finally, um, adopting in many instances exactly the same institutional rules, either the UNCITRAL arbitration rules or alternatively the institutional rules of one of the leading international commercial arbitration institutions like the ICC in Paris or the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. And finally, there was a substantial overlap in the personalities, the individuals, the people that were involved in the dispute resolution process. There were a substantial number of international commercial arbitrators, not by any means exclusively. There's a very interesting and diverse mix, but international commercial arbitration um, reflects in many ways the same personalities as international investment arbitration. And 
that that observation, the observation that bilateral investment treaties learned substantially and that dispute resolution under those treaties learned substantially from international commercial arbitration takes me, in fact, to the second part of my talk, the, the BATS, the Bilateral Arbitration Treaty, because my thesis is that just as BITS learned from international commercial arbitration, so international commercial arbitration and the resolution of international commercial disputes can learn from investment arbitration. It is a two-way flow of knowledge and learning and experience. And in particular, before I come on to explore that, let me describe what a bilateral arbitration treaty is um, before I say how exactly it has learned <coughs> from bilateral investment treaties. The basic concept of a BAT, a bilateral arbitration treaty, is as follows. Two states, and we can take Singapore and Romania again, um, <coughs> conclude a bilateral treaty which provides as a default mechanism, only a default mechanism, that all international commercial disputes between businesses based in the two countries will be finally resolved and exclusively resolved by international commercial arbitration. Now, I said that this is a default mechanism, and that is um, a, a fundamentally important aspect to the BAT. Parties would be free to contract out of the terms of the BAT, either by agreeing to a different form of dispute resolution, for example, resolution in a particular national court or set of national courts. Alternatively, arbitration in a particular and specified means, as so often occurs in international commercial agreements, or simply, as often occurs in the case of the Vienna Convention on the International Sale of Goods, by opting out of the BAT altogether, simply saying the BAT would not apply to, to this particular commercial relationship. Um, assuming, however, that the parties did not opt out of the Bilateral Arbitration Treaty, it would, as I said, provide that national courts in the two jurisdictions, that means Singapore and Romania, would, rather than entertaining a commercial dispute, between parties covered by the BAT, refer that dispute to arbitration under the terms of the Bilateral Arbitration Treaty. And the Bilateral Arbitration Treaty itself would, like a bit, provide an automatic mechanism for the resolution in a specified way of disputes by arbitration. That specified way could, for example, be by referring the disputes to arbitration under the UNCTRAL arbitration rules. Alternatively, as with BITS, a different set of institutional rules could be specified. The ICC, the Singapore International Arbitral Center's rules, or any other set of arbitration rules that one wished in the eyes of the two contracting states um, to, to employ in the treaty. The award of an arbitral tribunal constituted under the terms of the BAP would be final and binding in the same manner as a New York Convention award. That means it would be subject to um, annulment um, under the terms specified by the law of the arbitral seat, and it would be subject to recognition and enforcement in the two contracting state parties, in my example, Singapore and Romania, under the same provisions as the New York Convention. That, in broad outline, would be the um, framework for resolution of international commercial um, disputes um, under a bilateral arbitration treaty. It would move the presumptive place <coughs> for those disputes from national courts, and I'll emphasize the plural there, to international arbitration, and I'll emphasize the singular there for reasons that I'll come back to. Um, the reason for doing this, the reason for Singapore and Romania to adopt a bilateral arbitration treaty is simple. It is the same reason that arbitration was adopted in bilateral investment treaties, and the same reason that reasons that led states at this point, 155 states around the world, 
to accede to the New York Convention. That reason is that although any form of international dispute resolution is defective and um, unhappy in many respects, international arbitration is the least bad of those various options. International arbitration provides a means of dispute resolution that enables the parties to participate fully in the selection of the tribunal that will resolve their dispute, to participate fully in the formulation of procedural rules that will decide how their dispute gets resolved, and importantly in the international context, will provide not just expert decision makers using efficient and well-crafted procedural rules, but also a final and enforceable decision which is something that is, as we will see, quite often lacking in the international sphere. All the reasons that led 155 states to adopt the New York Convention and almost as many states to adopt the UNCTRAL model law on international commercial arbitration, giving effect to international arbitration agreements and international arbitral awards also apply to the arbitral mechanism in a bilateral arbitration treaty. And the fundamental purpose of the New York Convention, the UNCTRAL model law, and bilateral arbitration treaties would be to reduce the risks and uncertainties that are inherent in international commerce, to give businesses the confidence to trade with one another across national boundaries, across national legal systems, by providing a means of dispute resolution that is objective, neutral, expert, efficient, and perhaps most importantly, enforceable. Um, that is the affirmative case for bilateral arbitration treaties, albeit one stated very quickly. What, moving on to the final of the three installments in this talk then, what are the buts? What are the reasons that that affirmative case should fail? <clears throat> the first is a practical one in a sense. Um, well, how exactly could one have an international arbitration when the parties haven't negotiated an arbitration agreement that addresses things like, for example, language or the seat of the arbitration, when they haven't in their arbitration agreement <clears throat> said anything about practical details like the number of arbitrators or um, the procedural rules in the arbitration, how simply putting aside all the other problems with this proposal, how would the arbitration work as a practical matter? And that answer is in fact fairly easily um, supplied. The, the, the answer to that question is fairly easily supplied. Many arbitration agreements are no more detailed, in, in a number of cases even more skeletal than the arbitration agreement that I have outlined in this hypothetical that. That arbitration agreement as I've outlined it, although not negotiated between the parties and instead um, provided as a default by the treaty, would call for covered disputes between covered businesses being referred to UNCTRAL arbitration. That the treaty, the bilateral arbitration treaty, could be somewhat more detailed than this, and I can address the ways in which it could be more detailed, but let's assume, um, just for the sake of argument, the most skeletal form of arbitration agreement in the bilateral arbitration treaty. That provision would still be no less detailed than many commercial arbitration agreements that are given effect by national courts every day. By incorporating the UNCTRAL arbitration rules, the bilateral arbitration treaty would provide a mechanism for doing all the things, providing the answers to all the questions that I asked about three minutes ago. Provide a mechanism for choosing the arbitrators. If there are three arbitrators, each party chooses one, and the two co-arbitrators attempt to choose a presiding arbitrator in the event that the co-arbitrators are unable to do so an arbitration institution, in default the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, 
would select the presiding arbitrator. So there's a mechanism for selecting the arbitrators. Once selected, the arbitral tribunal would, under the arbitration rules, have the authority to choose the arbitral seat, the language of the arbitration, as well as to fashion, when the parties hadn't agreed on them, the arbitral procedures for the arbitration. I mean, it would have the authority to define the, the timetable for the party's submissions and all the other nitty-gritty procedural aspects that might cause one to question how such an arbitration would work in the first instance. And therefore, there would be no greater difficulty from a practical perspective in conducting an arbitration, an international arbitration, under this BAT, this bilateral arbitration treaty, than there would be under virtually any international commercial arbitration agreement. And, of course, if states wished to do so, they wouldn't have to, but if they wished to do so, they could add specificity on certain points. For example, states could provide a default or mandatory arbitral seat. They could, and my example of Singapore and, and Romania is, is, again, instructive, they could agree that the arbitral seat would be London or New York or some other place. They could agree that it would be um, a place chosen by the arbitral tribunal if they were unable to, to reach agreement on, on a neutral seat. The bilateral arbitration treaty could also specify a default language in the event um, that the parties didn't wish to agree otherwise. Um, the Singapore-Romania case is again instructive. Parties could agree that English or German or some other language would be the default language of the arbitration. And so, in the terms of the Bilateral Arbitration Treaty, it would be entirely possible to address various pras practical aspects of the arbitration, important practical aspects, um, but one would not need to do so. One could leave that to the Arbitral Tribunal, just as it is successfully left to the Arbitral Tribunal in a very substantial <coughs> number of commercial arbitrations that happen every day today. So, that, that takes care, in a sense, of, of an initial practical concern about how a bat might, might actually work. Um, so the second, the second and, and perhaps more fundamental objection would, would be that of party autonomy. Aren't, in this case, aren't you um, denying the parties their autonomy? Isn't party autonomy the freedom to choose how disputes will be resolved fundamental to not just international commercial dispute resolution, but, but in many ways to all forms of dispute resolution, all forms of private interaction. And the answer is yes, of course, but this proposal doesn't trench upon, doesn't compromise the principle of party autonomy because, as I emphasized previously, it provides a default solution. Parties are free in the exercise of their autonomy to contract out of the BATS arbitration mechanism. If they don't want to proceed to arbitration under a bilateral arbitration treaty, they can either in advance or after a dispute arises agree to have their, their dispute resolved anywhere they wish, by expert determination, <coughs> by a different form of arbitration, by national court litigation in a specified national court or two or more national courts if that's what they wished to do. Being a default mechanism, the BAT would in no sense compromise the party's autonomy. It would simply provide a different baseline rule for how international dispute resolution is conducted. We currently conduct international dispute resolution, and this is a point I'm going to come back um, to in a few moments. We currently conduct international dispute resolution. For the most part, there are some regional variations on this, important regional variations, but nonetheless exceptions to the basic rule we currently conduct international dispute resolution by leaving the parties free to go to their national courts, which both parties frequently do, to seek to obtain home court judgments that they then attempt, often unsuccessfully, to enforce against one another in their home court jurisdiction. Uh, a, an approach towards international dispute resolution, which I will in a few moments suggest is an unhappy one. For present purposes, though, the important point is simply the party's autonomy, either to choose that, the existing form of dispute resolution, or something different is in no way compromised by the BAT. 
All of that does, just like all a bit does, is change the baseline starting rule, baseline starting point, the default solution for international dispute resolution without affecting the party's freedom to choose something different if they wish to. So, assuming that that leaves critics, at least for the moment, mollified, what is the next but? Well, a, a fundamental but would be well, there's this, this notion of state sovereignty, public policy. Um, aren't we ceding to secret private arbitrators authority over vital aspects of public policy, regulatory authority, and so forth? Um, and the answer there is no. Not if you listen to how I describe what the BAT covers. Because what the BAT covers is commercial disputes between businesses. And it would, even as stated, exclude other kinds of dispute, but just so that nobody missed the point, it would also include express carve-outs for other things, express statements excluding, for example, consumer disputes, labor and employment disputes, and any other disputes that states considered inappropriate for resolution by arbitration. For example, one might want to include antitrust or comp competition law disputes. Conversely, as some countries' courts in the commercial arbitration context have done, they might want to include those disputes for various reasons in what could be arbitrated. But states, in their bilateral arbitration treaty, would be free to exclude whatever categories of disputes they thought would compromise unduly their national regulatory and governmental authority. And finally, not unimportantly, but finally, like the New York Convention and the UNCTRAL model law, the BAT would be subject to the same non-arbitrability, the same general non-arbitrability and public policy exceptions as currently exist under the New York Convention and the model law. Namely, disputes would not need to be referred to arbitration and arbitral awards would not need to be recognized and enforced if they can concern so-called non-arbitrable matters or if the terms of the award violated public policy in the enforcing state. These are escape valves. They are escape valves that have been used sparingly and only rarely by contracting states to the New York Convention, but nonetheless they're important. They play an important role in the overall architecture of the, the Convention and would do so as well under the Bilateral Arbitration Treaty. Their existence, though, makes the third but um, just a stutter. Um, it makes the third but a reason that one need not be concerned about trenching unduly on sovereign regulatory authority because states would, as they have already done, be free to exclude disputes of that character from the terms of the bilateral arbitration treaty. So, what next? The fourth, fourth possible but. Um, aren't, isn't one in adopting a bilateral arbitration treaty, denying parties access to justice, isn't one denying parties that most fundamental of all civil rights, the right of access to public courts? Isn't that something that guaranteed by Article 6 of the European <coughs> Convention on Human Rights here, due process clause and similar guarantees in, in the United States and comparable guarantees of access to courts in, in other countries? Isn't that preventing parties, preventing a party from going to court to resolve its disputes, isn't that taking away something very fundamental um, from the citizens that, at least in, in some countries, is constitutionally guaranteed, but certainly even if it's not of fundamental importance? That's a very serious but. It's one that requires um, serious attention and, and demands a serious response. It's absolutely true that access to justice is fundamentally important. 
but the bat doesn't decrease access to justice for reasons that I've already alluded to. It enhances and creates access to justice which doesn't currently exist. And the reason for that is that in an international context, I put aside domestic cases, in an international context, access is not access to a court. It is access to courts in the plural, which is why I used the plural about 20 minutes ago. Access to courts means each party runs to its own home courts, often seeking a favorable, sometimes parochial, sometimes worse, home court judgment against its adversary. And that's one of the reasons that parties are so frequently unwilling <coughs> or not anxious to litigate in their counterparties' home courts. And then with both parties, having sought the assistance of their own home courts and two parallel litigations, perhaps more if the parties are created and well-funded litigations in yet other jurisdictions, third, fourth, fifth parallel proceedings. The parties at considerable expense and substantial delay obtain judgments which frequently are unenforceable by virtue of the absence of any global convention, treaty, on the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. And as a consequence, after years of expensive litigation producing inconsistent and unenforceable results, the parties are not left with having been provided access to justice, even though they had access to courts. They have been denied in a very fundamental way access to justice. And <clears throat> what the BAT does actually, when you step back and think about it, is to provide access to justice in those cases. It provides a superior mechanism for providing justice in those cases because it centralizes disputes in a single forum rather than multiplicitous, expensive, and often biased forums. It provides for expert, objective, neutral, and efficient dispute resolution as opposed to multiplicitous and inconsistent proceedings often in domestic courts with limited experience of international commercial matters. And then finally, it provides for a final binding and enforceable decision instead of unenforceable national court judgments. That, at the end of the day, even though it inevitably will have very real defects, every dispute resolution mechanism does is much better than what we currently have. It provides access to justice rather than denying access to justice. And so therefore, when you actually step back and think about it, the fifth but isn't a but at all. It is a reason that one ought to do this. And so what is the final but? The final but is the same but that confronted all the women and men who participated in drafting the New York Convention in 1958, and all the women and men who participated in drafting the 3,000 bilateral investment treaties that we have today. And that but is that when they started those processes, there was no New York Convention, and there were no bits. It was unknown and it was unheard of. The final but is fear of the unknown of doing something that's different. But when you step back and think about the way our current dispute resolution system for international commercial matters works, it doesn't really work very well. And the bat is something that, even though it's unknown, is something we should embrace. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much.